Hey, so everybody, can I get your attention up here? Howdy, uh, this is IoT Deep Dive. Um, we... <laughs> I'll give him a second. Anywho, so can I get a show of hands for who has an embed enabled board? Yeah, yeah, the K64. Who does not have a board? You don't have a board. Come up here and get a board. Do you want a board? So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be doing Wi-Fi and a couple of connectivity protocols that are prevalent in IoT. There's definitely a couple hundred of them. I chose the three that are most prevalent and have the most well-supported libraries that are not changing every other week. I'm looking at, you know, like Ruby on Rails and that kind of thing. Um, so what we're going to have today is uh, a four piece of hardware we're going to be touching. We're going to have a Freedom K64F board. It's this blue board. If you don't have one, you got some windows up front. You need a USB cable to connect the board to the computer. We then have an ESP Wi-Fi module and an adapter board so you don't have to jerry-rig with all the little jumpers on it. If you don't have either one of these, can you raise your hand for me? So who doesn't have the Wi-Fi chip or the adapter board? Oh, the purple thing. Is the purple thing? I'm going to get a purple thing. All right, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and get started then. So, the first thing we're going to talk about today is the ESP Wi Fi module. It's a $5 Wi Fi module out of China. Uh, you might have heard about it. It's kind of all the craze in the maker movement because it's a $5 Wi Fi module. For point of reference, the nearest Wi-Fi modules from other uh, contenders either don't have security or cost like $20. I'm not going to name names, but if you try doing better Wi-Fi, it's nothing's $5 and nothing supports as much as this one does, which is why we chose to use it for this meetup series. Um, the big thing about this Wi-Fi module is they open source the source code for it, and so there's a bunch of different firmwares that exist out there. We're going to be using the official one from Espressif, the people who make the ESP, you know, espresso spelled ESP, whatever, hence the chip ESP. They're kind of vain like that. Anyways, um, so we're going to talk about the AT command set. Um, and one of the biggest features about this chip is it has its TCP IP stack on chip. So you don't have to have all that software on your side. You just hook up to it and say, hey, I want to send TCP. And the chip goes, okay, I got it. Don't worry about it. Tell me what you want to send, and I'll take care of it for you. So that's really one of the big reasons why it's so awesome. Talking about the firmwares, there's depending on how you count it, between four and 30 different official firmwares. Um, so Espresso for the people who make the chip, they've got one, it's an AT command set. Uh, AT Thinker, which if you bought your board from the Amazon link I sent out, you probably got an AT Thinker firmware on there. Uh, theirs is also AT command set based. Funny enough, those two AT command sets, not compatible at all. Like seriously, uh, at all. Then there's two other big ones called NodeMCU and MicroPython. NodeMCU essentially turns the chip into a Lua command terminal, and MicroPython turns it into a Python command terminal. So if you hook up to it over a serial line, if you've got the NodeMCU uh, firmware loaded, you can uh, write raw Lua directly into it and just takes it and handles it. This enables some really cool, really powerful features like NQTT on chip and things like that. But we're going to stick with the official Espresso firmware because these other three firmwares in the last month have had massive, massive revision changes to their command set, whereas Espresso has not. So I chose to write my firmware and my stack against the one that changes the least so it'll last the longest without all the software being useless. Does that make sense? Seeing some glazed eyes. Okay. So if you've got all the parts, this is how you're gonna to wanna to wire up your board. You're gonna take, once again, the little blue board, which is the ESP8266, connect it to the little purple board as displayed there. So it looks like this. Then you're going to take one of these jumper cables, 
and you're going to plug it into those pins on the Fusion K64. Uh, if everyone would go ahead and do that, that would be really handy. Uh, you can validate that you've got everything hooked up correctly because if you plug in your K64 up to power, you should see a little light come on in your board. How much smoke is it supposed to make? As long as you get the red one in the right place and the black one in the right place, it'll smoke. You can um, reverse, it's magic blue smoke though. Uh, a light on the little board? Doesn't come on. No. Okay. Yeah. It's mine or this guy. Yeah. Uh, that one might have gotten hard because we did that for a couple of hours. Yeah. It should still work. We'll double check it in a second. Yeah. Mine is a known guy. I'm working on it. It's not mine. This is brand new. Might be wrong about that. Like, I believe it might come on. I know it comes on when you send stuff. Right. I remember I had a nightmare of anything that happened at all. I missed, I didn't have my chips got tied. Tied everything over. Oh, I. Last one. Oh, that's his physical connection. You are a Oh, yeah, you are. So this is an RX is a TX, that's power ground. Follows. Uh, and the reason I made these little purple boards is because you actually have to jump or some things together, a chip select to ground or power, I think it was, to make it come up. And so I just turned it over the board instead of having extra time. Uh, the one that says open SDA on the bottom. Uh, SDA stands for serial debug adapter. Because we ordered a very special, a special match for the LEDs for the power of work. So I think that when we start sending data, we'll see it. Hi, does everybody have a wire up like this? No, you ordered the one. No idea what it's going to be. So, to give you an idea of what's hooked up here, too, red and black are obviously power and ground. This is D0, and this is D1. That's UR, TX, and UX, and RX. TX and RX. Uh, because it's serial module, so we're talking in the serial. You got one of the bigger ESP modules, they've got stuff like SPI and I2C, but because it's the cheapest $5 one, it's just that you Okay, anyone not there yet? Can I move on? You haven't wired up yet? <laughs> it's alright, you got it from me, and these the LEDs a little bit janky in that match. Don't worry. In a little bit, when we start sending data, you'll see a blue light flashing, and that'll give you your indicator. Okay, so moving on. Um, who brought their own ESP board? Okay, you guys did. Um, because it looks like the majority of you, well, of you who brought your own ESP board, who did the firmware update already? You, you guys, okay. So let me see the hands from people who haven't done, who brought their own, but didn't do the firmware update. And just keep them up because I'm going to give you an updated module just to speed things along. There you go. There you go. Now, what else we got? I downloaded the code. I thought it was going to download. I updated. Okay. 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 Okay.
Cool. Yeah. So the reason that we're doing this is because I could show you how to update the firmware on this, but then we'd waste 20 minutes and we'd have to drop one of the protocols we talk about. Instead, uh, if you're interested in learning how to do the firmware update process, I've got a well-documented over this Google.gl link that walks you through how to set everything up. If you look on um, the purple board, there's two little jumpers here, or two pins. Uh, you jumper the two pins on the bottom right. When you plug the board into power, that puts it in the firmware update mode. Uh, I've got a program at that link that you load onto your embed board, and then you can program it uh, using the instructions on the web page to update the firmware. This whole process will take between five and 10 minutes or so, uh, 20 minutes if we have to debug anything. So in lieu of doing that in class, I'm just gonna point you at the directions and let you go for it. Uh, and ask any questions you have on your forums, and make sure to answer them. Does anyone have any objections to this? Because I can show you how to do it if you like. We'll just have to drop one of the protocols. No, <laughs> the boards that you give us, is there firmware that's on it that would work? Yes. Do you just want the latest? Or? Uh, yeah, so right, so today I had my wonderful interns go through every board we had in the lab and update all of them. So if I handed you a board, it has the right firmware guarantee. And again, that's the espresso firmware with the AT commands. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Right, that's part of that. We're just going to say that you've updated your firmware in the bug. So, protocols. Let's take a look first at HTTP. Um, who here has not heard of HTTP? I, uh... Anyways, um, so HTTP, if you remember from last time, there are two base protocols for the internet. One's TCP, one's UDP. Um, free for view, everything is built on sockets. You have a socket abstraction so that your high level application doesn't have to worry about your base layer hardware. Uh, TCP and UDP serve as the majority of that interface. Uh, UDP is kind of send it and forget it with no guarantee of delivery. TCP does guarantee your delivery and it has an acknowledgement. Uh, the downside to that being it has a larger overhead. And since we're doing embedded devices, we're always concerned about how much space our protocols are using. So, on that note, HTTP is TCP based. It guarantees your stuff will get where it's going. Uh, assuming there's something there, if you're talking to nothing, of course it won't get there because there's nothing there and you'll leave the appropriate, uh, appropriate map. Um, it is widely used. Everyone's heard of TCP, or sorry, everyone's heard of HTTP. Everything has HTTP. Every web browser has it. Your smartphone has it. All of a your doorbell has it because someone put an embedded HTTP server on it already. It's everywhere. Uh, every server platform supports it from NodeMCU, or sorry, from Node.js to Apache to even Windows. Everything has it. Uh, the other thing is it is stateless, so that lowers the overhead of the requirement that you have to have. You don't really have to worry about getting something out of sync. Every connection is a one off, and you're done, and that's it. Uh, downsides it's kind of on the larger side of things. So it's kind of on the larger side of things, and this is because HTTP was brought about without the thought of embedded systems. Back when HTTP was invented, an embedded system was an 8-bit MCU that maybe had a K in flash RAM, if you're lucky. Probably not, probably significantly less. Like we're talking in bytes, not in kilobytes. So the idea of having an HTTP stack on an embedded system, the two just never went together. That's changed now, we're now 20, 30 years on and MCUs are now as powerful as computers used to be back then. So now the thought of having HTTP on the embedded system is totally a valid thought. Um, the one downside to HTTP is because it's been around so long, it kind of varies everywhere. Uh, we'll get into that in a second with the headers. But back in the browser wars, anyone remember those? Back when Netscape Navigator and like Alta Vista were things? Yeah, th thank you. Um, back then, everyone took HTTP as a suggestion more than a requirement. And so to this day, you'll still see like Microsoft server versus Apache server, and they will be like, oh, I want to do this thing. And they say totally different things to accomplish it. And that's fine if you're Firefox, and you've known about this for years, and you've just got an if-else statement in your code. But if you're an embedded developer, and you set it up to work with one server, and all of a sudden you switch to use a different server, everything breaks, you have no idea why. That can take a long time to figure out, because you don't necessarily know these things because you're not a web yet. So just a thing to watch out for, the headers will be slightly weird on different servers. Um, also the downside, because it is stateless, everything you want to transfer requires a new connection, regardless of what it is. So each time you load up a web page, if it's got three or four JavaScript scripts in there, each one of those to get the file is a new connection. Each time you want an image, that's a new connection. 
that becomes an Im a issue on embedded systems when you only have, say, five sockets you can open at a time. So if I try and load a web page that has, oh, let's be reasonable, let's say a very basic HTML web page designed by a freshman in high school right now, that'll have 30 to 40 files in it, easily. An embedded system can't handle that. So you don't plan on loading web pages with an embedded system. Think more along the lines of parsing data streams. So you wouldn't load it all in the memory and then parse it. Parse it as you go. Uh, or you might just get, say, meta information about the website and parse that. Sound good? OK, cool. So the next thing, um, HTTP is a client server architecture. And remember I said each thing is its own connection? This is kind of how it works. The client will send a request to the server. The server will send back a response. And the client will say, OK, I got that. We're done. And the connection closes. This happens for every JavaScript file, every image file, every iframe, anything you want on the web page. Um, there are three components to the request and the response. Uh, in, the, in the request, there's a type, in which case you specify what type of request you're making. Things like put, get, delete, those are all uh, types that you can specify. You then specify a series of headers and a payload. The response comes back with a status message. Uh, things like 404 not found, 404 is a status message. Things like 200, status OK, means everything is successful, here's the thing you wanted. Uh, there's a long list of things, or there's a long list of response messages. Um, if you're interested in the notes section on this slide and in the documentation from the meetup, which are all linked to the meetup.com page, there's links to all of this in very robust forms through Wikipedia because it's well documented. Um, yeah, so it comes out of the status, headers, and payload. Uh, I'm going to point out this headers thing is what I talked about varying between implementations like Apache and Microsoft. And we'll get to that on the next slide. So the request has got the request line, uh, put, post, uh, get, delete. You've got your headers, payload, uh, status line, response, headers, payload. Any questions before I move on? Second. So here's an example uh, of embed.org. I actually just pulled this a couple hours ago. Um, I sent a simple HTTP GET request. When you type something into your web browser and hit enter, that's a GET request. It's getting that web page. And the web page <coughs> is the response that comes back in the payload section. What you don't see in that is this section right here, the header section. These are things that are handed off in the background <laughs> that you as a user probably never see. <laughs> the web page is all down here in the payload. Uh, so if I'm sending post data or anything like that, that gets stuff in the payload and comes back and all that jazz. But this section, the headers, is where you specify the host name, any cookies you want to transfer, um, languages that you're accepting. You can reject things. You can have your own custom headers if you want. And you just got to make sure that the server on the other side understands what you're sending. Um, yeah. Any questions? Cool. It's worth noting um, that HTTP headers are JSON before JSON was a thing. They're key value pairs. And if you look close, you'll see that there's a header name, semicolon, a value. And that's how things are transferred back then. Um, because it was JSON before it was JSON, there's about 500 or so well-specified headers. Again, Wikipedia is your friend. Um, but there's also custom headers because it was free flow. You could do whatever you wanted to. So you'll see a lot of old web services implemented their entire API using custom headers. I don't recommend doing it this way. I recommend instead using JSON and just stuffing it in the payload for when you want to create your own API. Cool. So now we're going to do some examples. If everyone would go ahead and take their ESP board and you got it all wired up, plug it into your computer. Go to this address, which is goo.gl slash qrzxoq, mind the caps because they matter. Uh, that'll take you to the web page with the example program. By now, the majority of you know the drill. If your neighbor does not know the drill, please help them out with uh, importing and compiling the program. The program that you're going to compile will do both get and put in order. Uh, you're going to want to point it at demo SSID, all lowercase. Then you're going to want the password to be a single space. All right, 
go and get that running. You should get some output on your terminal. Um, once it looks like everyone's moving along, I'll throw mine up here to show you how it's done. And we'll be walking around the room if anyone has any trouble with uh, getting your example. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, that's not what you want. Yeah, but you can't get the more. Oh, I'm not Oh, I'm not I'm not I'm not so I've got a little browser built over here. I'm running everything together because Capital Factory or Wi-Fi doesn't like that we have support. Um, their own password has got some weird shenanigans and spaces, which is like a Okay. I have a laptop, yes. Okay, show me the code. I got a well, I mean, which loader board do you need? Yeah. All of it? Which are you using? So there's a K64 app and the ESD chip. Yeah, that's true. So you have K64s over there at the mall, but we're out of ESDs. Oh, okay. Error return code three. That means something has gone wrong when it gets All right. It's not out there. Perfection page using get. Oh, that's in the right space. I suspect they're going to reset it again because I think my. We don't have access to the internet, so I couldn't trick it by changing the domain. Mm -hmm. I couldn't change the. Uh, I just wanted to get the uh, board to connect. Well, yes, two board and big blue box. Uh, so the, uh, he's bringing the Wi Fi chip. Oh, so the blue one's over there in the box. Yeah, yeah. So I would take this one in first class. I only have one of the boards, unfortunately. I have a little board. Excuse me, one of those. Okay, you can sit next to the USB? Uh, yeah. Any suggestion on that error option? Awesome. Trying to diagnose it right now. No. So the password is a space and not a blank, not a nothing. Okay. Try giving it nothing instead of a space. Tell me what. Yeah, if you're, if you're finding it, it's like, that can be a good start. It can be. Yeah, you have to be so mysterious. So, I validate that that is in fact working. Is this the chip I give you? Yes, sir, and I get that, and sometimes I get some other tips. Maybe I'll let it work. Okay. 
So once you burn the uh, what is it to I put uh, the freedom board with? Hmm? I'm mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever you reset, we have not flash DSP, so you don't get anything on them. I mean, I got it from Kyle, but I don't really know what to do. I mean, I drag and drop the bit. You're looking for a way to tell if your surfboard's working? Yeah. yeah when, when, you, when you run that program, it's a real long delay. Oh, yeah. It's a real long delay. It's a real long delay. It's a real long delay. It's a real long you might have the wrong speed set for your device. So just want to try to get that one to the that's what I'm saying. 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 That's what i am saying that i am saying that i am saying that i am saying that i am saying all right, whenever you're done, I can try again. It might fail also with this. Yeah, mine's, mine's failing too. I'll test it. Go for it, please. On the real one. Please. By the way, that is the real one. It is for my I can paint it through. Oh, you're trying to. Yeah, I'm paying it through. It's one I've ever had. It's one I've ever had. I don't know. 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 I don't I don't think so. I think it's going on with the tutorials. Because, yeah, you go into the web browser, the web browser is connected to wireless. So you connect to this, the problem is only if, if it's going over wireless now, like one of these guys, so why, why would the router be any different on this laptop than everybody else's router? So it's like there's one. For reference, this is what you should be getting in your output terminal. You should see it trying to fetch, fetching uh, from the website, getting the response back, and then trying to post and getting the post response back. Uh, we are seeing some issues on the wireless. We're going to keep trying for the next couple minutes. And if it looks like the Capital Factory wireless has decided to stop working with us, uh, we might just have to move on and trust me, it works. It's definitely not what I <laughs> Yes, I know. Um, hey, the, the yes, LED is so on now. Yes, it is. I'm going to share with uh, oh, my uh, oh, yeah. work my oh, yeah. 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 Yes, if you find a party that Brian, I don't see why he is updating for me. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, proof, proof of life. Uh, my chip up here was able to connect, so if your chip is having trouble, try power cycling your board completely, uh, disconnecting and reconnecting, and then maybe that'll work. Took me about two tries to do it, I'm not entirely sure why. I'm gonna blame the Wi-Fi. Hey, what's your old kind of Tell them. What's your old kind of Wi-Fi? Uh, cool term. It works? It just works. It automatically scans and finds it. It looks for activity on the on the port and just goes, you're using this one. Can I just yes, it's a serial formula. But like I said, the web is not working, so I'm not down with it right now. So are you on general SSID? 
So who's still having trouble? Cool, I'm going to make the rounds. Uh, but it's just a I was getting that from my old so it doesn't work over here. Are, you, are the lights turning on for you? No. Ah, right. So, so this is what you should be seeing on the board. You should see a little red LED indicating the power is on. And then when I run the program, you should see the blue LED blink when it's sending data. If the LEDs are not on, your laptop is not supplying enough current to power the thing. Therefore, it will totally bomb. Um, I have mine hooked up to the high power charging port on my laptop. If you have, say, uh, a USB power adapter, try plugging in the power adapter, see if that'll work. But if your board does not have a red LED on and it is not flashing blue LED when you're sending data, your board is not on. You can confirm that password was a space or a... Space, no, space works. Confirm that. It might take two tries to get to work, but it does work. Does it matter? So you're trying to do it. That can matter. Yeah. yeah. Generally, if you have this plug in, it depends on your manufacturer. Being this. My ThinkPad's providing enough juice without a without a charger. Keep flashing. Do we have, do we have jump? I need jumpers though to flash them. Go pull around someone else's board. It's one of the best you floating around with jumpers. Oh wait, here who's back? This jumper's all back. So for example, clear data, disconnect, connect. Using one for the white So somehow it <laughs> So that's what it should look like. Mine doesn't work right to this. Show me the front. So see this? It's currently it's currently powered on. It's currently sending data. You need a big capacitor on your definitely. On my breadboard, I had to put a huge gap because the thing would also Yeah. So this is your board guaranteed to be working. I'm going to unplug it and bring it over here. In fact, let's just leave this plugged in and see if it provides enough juice in your laptop. Wow. That's ridiculous. I mean, re rip them out of the way. I mean, I'm going to start it, you know, but also we take this one up there and then we get it there. So, Yeah. Damn it. Okay, what did I miss up? Brown's off. 
Grounds on the wrong pin. Grounds on the wrong pin. Let me fix that. Oh, ground is wrong. Ground is wrong. Ground is wrong. Oh, ground is wrong. Ground is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on, I gotta fix this real quick. These are loner ASP, just wanna remind you of that. Who knows, who's in those? Well, that doesn't work, but I didn't see the line, so I can't reach it. I got a Okay, so sorry, that's the right pen. I'm using a different board. Yeah, so it was second up from the middle one, not second up from the bottom one, which is exactly how I looked at it and put it in second from the bottom. Okay, you got my check it anyway. <laughs> hey, how about that? <laughs> hey, now I got a light. Hey, success. It works. It works. It's like a little miniature. It was in a space or nothing? Space. Put a space in, that'll work. Yes, a connection open. Connection. Oh, it's really good. No, like, the embed device is dated a serial. No, driver. So, did you get in? No. So, for reference. This is what your code should look like if I minimize everything. All right, yes, we got it. It's right there, demo SSID in a space. That should let you hook up and get everything working. Wait, why is the bot below say 9600? Oh, okay, so. The, this is setting up the ESP8266 interface. The ESP talks at 11.52. Uh, I then set the board to talk to your computer at 9600 because that's the default on every serial terminal program type. They just default to 9600 because, like I said, and so I set it at that so there wasn't another <laughs> Is it working? Yeah. Do you see it? I don't know yet. Just, just work. Yeah, I can connect it up. Yeah, it's working. Hey! I'm waiting. It takes a long time for it to change your ground. Oh, uh, that is a dead word, yeah. so I think my ground's fine. Oh, yeah. yeah. How long did it take you? Uh, uh, 20 seconds or something? Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, well, yeah, so the bot rate to the chip is 11 to 5. Okay, one Let's double check if it works. 43 seconds. set button. Yeah, it's spelled the wrong way. Yeah, he fried his board. Yeah. Well, no, there it is. We just fried the power indicator. Uh, it's yeah. actually sending stuff over. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Awesome sauce. So, has everybody gotten it to send data into data back yet? No. <laughs> you haven't? 
Who has not gotten into work yet? You guys in the front row and the back. You're seeing the red aluminum, right? Yes. Okay, let's try power cycling the entire system by unplugging and plugging back in in a free silver. Power cycling. This thing will go into a little quick And then the reset has to be a full power cycle because the software will set clear. It doesn't actually give it a piece of like this. Demo SSID and then a space for the password. I would hit reset because I should have already printed that. Or at least the time. What's that? I don't think my Mac is under power. Are you on the right com port? Okay, so now it's working. Yeah, on, give, it, give it a second. Give it a second. Let's see if it, let's see if it actually works. Even without the LED on? Yeah, it looks like you blew the power LED out. When, when it sends data, the little blue LED will come on. So let's see if it'll work. Oh, so it seems like everything is moved fast. It's about 43 seconds. Yeah. Do you remember? Like, I haven't flashed the firmware since I got launched. Do you remember? I remember there was that thing with the two folders where it was like new and new and new. Oh, no, not new. It's the other one. Okay. Yeah, the one that has a version. Yeah, see, it's not working. So your chip is working. It's grabbing the get data from the right place. It's sending the post data. So it works. Okay, so try plugging in yours, see if you can get that data. Yeah, okay. It's your try. Uh, <laughs> That's all. But in your terminal program, Yeah, 
Yeah, but where is it printing that message to? I only have the last so, so when you get your like that, yeah, it's exactly. There's like an IP address for the Chromecast. You can actually address, yeah, you direct the web page again. Then it feeds you a little, yeah, web page you can type in. Or they call this SSID or password. You can't enter it. It's just for Mac. Well, I don't know. Actually, I don't. Oh, yeah, you don't. I don't know. You have to download their app. Probably still using sockets, but it's a nice depending size. Yeah, the last thing you want to do is it's all done, but I don't find out installing the screen. It's all simple. It's all in the server. It's not for execution. It's all in the server. 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 Yeah. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we're going to move on to the next protocol. We're not going to get the next protocol done. So everyone saw that it worked in one way or another, right? Yes, correct. <laughs> I saw the lady. Well, welcome to the, the world of $5 microcontrollers. You, you get uh, cheap product, and cheap product performs like cheap product. <laughs> so but when you hear a professional engineer say, no, I'm not going to use the $5 microcontroller, this is one of the reasons why. Because the $20 microcontroller will just work. Anyway, moving on. It is on the ESP chip. It has it on the chip. So, moving on. Uh, no, I don't think so. So, final thoughts on HTTP. Um, limited space. If you try to load, say, embed.org, instead of doing it against uh, HTTP embed.org, you would have pulled down the entire web page. That web page sits at right around 400 kilobytes to 2 megabytes, depending on the time of day and what Twitter feeds it's pulling in and all this other stuff. That board has a mega flash memory on it. You would have easily overflowed any buffer you had set. In fact, if you go and you look in the HTTP client library, there's a couple of headers up top that pound define buffer sizes and they accommodate on a case-by-case -case basis how big the buffer is you can pull in. So I just want you all to keep that in mind. You will run out of buffer space. Yes, sir. What? And then everything else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is the lady who got the uh, HTTP client working for us today. So Good thank you, Sarah. Uh, 
Again, do it yourself better. If anyone's interested in doing a uh, header injection, so if you wanted to add a cookie or you wanted to add something more than just the basic headers you were given, because if you look at the headers here, let's pull that across. If you look at the headers, the Git request has got one header in it. It's got the host header. If you wanted to add more into there, there is a way to do that. Um, it's outlined right there in the slides. It is more or less a manual injection in the code. You define a string at a certain point when the stack is adding its headers, you toss it in there. Uh, it is not elegant, but nor is she to be stacked on the devices. Uh, that chip goes to this man right here. Uh, right here, with his phone. Um, right. If you look right here under args, there's an args variable. If you're familiar with uh, HTTP GET requests, you can say like question mark Q equals something. And so that would set the key Q with a value, whatever you put in there. And that way you can pass arguments to the server and then the response back from the server, you can get data back. Um, next month we're gonna be talking about APIs and we'll dig more into that and how to send data from client to server and get it back again. Um, yeah. So again, the buffers you want to watch out for down here are the chunk size, send buffer size, and max URL hosting length. Uh, if you run into issues where buffers overrun when you're trying to play with this at home, these are probably the things you want to look at. Um, and one other thing, this library does have the ability to do OAuth and BAuth and SSL. The SSL library it's currently using is uh, CYA SSL. Uh, if you're familiar with the security libraries that exist, it works, not all the time. So if you run into an issue with uh, SSL, it's probably with that. Uh, I'm currently working on porting it to Polar SSL, so stay tuned on that front. Um, if you have any questions about this, please look at the slides and at the, uh, the documentation. I did make sure to very verbosely outline everything we're doing in the notes section below on the slides and the documentation. So websites, the next technology. Uh, WebSockets are based on HTTP, which is why we're talking about them after HTTP. Um, the reason that WebSockets are cool is because they provide a real-time data pipe. Remember how previously with uh, HTTP I told you that every connection you wanted was a one-off? So I'd open up and say, hey, I want this file. And the server would say, okay, here's your file. And then that'd be the end of that. WebSockets are a way of keeping that connection open and bi-directional. And by the nature of how they optimize some things, it's guarding your real time. So if you've ever seen like one of those smartphone apps where it shows everyone who's logged in at the moment walking around the city in real time, odds are they've got a WebSocket connection open to each of those clients, pulling back that GPS data and then displaying it for everyone. So when I say real time, I mean you can't really see the lag at all. It's quite wonderful. Um, it has native support in every browser that exists, with the exception of like Opera Mini. Yeah, and again, real time. Uh, some of the cons. Uh, WebSockets does not necessarily scale particularly well. Because it is an open TCP connection, and because it is a bi-directional real-time connection, every device has to have a WebSocket connection to the server. So for every device the server connects to, that's a port that gives up. So if I've got 100 WebSocket connections, I've got 100 ports taken up. Once you start scaling to 10,000, 100,000, you very quickly run out of ports. That's, that's kind of a problem. With the real time, you, you kind of, one to many is not a thing. It's strictly one to one. Um, oh, and it does require a dedicated server. So, slight downside there. Any questions about WebSocket so far? So, on demand, can't you like uh, uh, open up like servers of the connections like, so that you don't run out of ports? So, there's a limit of. There's a physical limit of the number of ports you can have on a computer. A uh, certain number are reserved out of the gate for uh, computer functions, and then outside of that, you're going to be good. Once you hit about 100,000 connections, though, you're going to start running out of connections on a server. Really, for load balancing purposes, it's not good to get near, near that number. Uh, it's much better to then load balance across multiple servers. So you got to start taking that into account and in infrastructure backing. Uh, what what compare this against uh, in TTP maps? Yeah. I'll show you the protocol right now, and one's better than the other in certain situations. So this is the basic model for WebSockets. The client initiates an HTTP connection. One of the headers that it passes in its GET request is a thing called uh, upgrade request. So it sends across the header that says upgrade request uh, as the key. The value would be WebSocket, 
The server then looks at that and goes, yeah, they can do WebSockets, let's do that. The handshake, and then a tunnel is opened up between the two. At that point, either one can send and receive back and forth, and the other one will get it, guaranteed, no problems. Um, one cool benefit of this protocol is either side can shut down the connection. Unlike with uh, regular HTTP, which is a one-way shutdown, um, in WebSockets, when either one decides to shut the connection, it gracefully falls apart. So you don't have to worry about things blowing up in the middle of the state structure. It has that all covered for you. So in HTTP, it's the server that closes the connection after it sends a response? No, it's the client. The server sends back the thing and the client has to act it. If it doesn't act it, the server will keep spamming things down until it gets a response. And there, there can be timeouts to handle things like that. Yeah. Uh, that's how you can do certain like DDoS attacks, where you go, hey, here's a thing, a little bit of data, and we'll let them spam you back. You can then take over the infrastructure of the machine and make it you know, halt with too many incoming connections like that. So, a uh, WebSocket example. I am going to set up, really quickly, a WebSocket server. Uh, if you would like to set up your own WebSocket server in Python, uh, there are instructions here on how to do that. Uh, it's done using a thing called Twinado. So if you've got Python 2.7.9 or greater installed, you can just uh, do pip install Tornado uh, and then run Tornado out of the gate. It'll start a server up and you can run that. Um, so we can either do that or I can set one up on my machine and everyone can hit against it. What do y'all want to try doing? Can I get a show of hands who wants to set up their own server? Okay, who wants me to set up the server? <laughs> Okay, fair enough. If you do go home and you don't find an open WebSocket server somewhere, these are the instructions that take you to the magical web page and how to set up your own connection. I promise it's really easy. Um, used to be really hard because Python now includes all the packages you need as part of its index. You just run the install command and it works. There's no more no um, So if everyone would then go ahead and go to this link, the bottom link, grab the WebSocket program, compile it, well, get it imported. I'm going to set the server and give you my server IP that you can then hit. Oh, yeah, make sure you change the Wi Fi to demo SSID and space. So we're going to be on the demo SSID network again. <laughs> so um, this is where I'm running the WebSocket server. The IP address is 192.168.11.3. Uh, so point your program at that IP address and go for it. 168 what? Can you make that bigger? Uh, unfortunately, I can't because someone doesn't want me to scroll like that. I can't hover it anymore. 192.168.11.3. Yeah, let me double check that. It should be slash slash. Not web I forget whatever the one that was this one. They just they just repeat out Oh, uh, so the, the port number is, what, what is the default in the program? Is it 8088? Okay, let me change that real quick. The IP address was on the server, 4168. Yeah. Slash 11.3. 11.3. 4.8. Should be running on 8888. It's right now the default is slash WS on the end, too. Is it just 4.88 or 8888? Uh, no, keep it the way it is. 
So, so IP slash WS. Say something. I have WS. I have color. Yeah, slash WS is correct. I think he said it's So if anyone's interested, that's the source code for the server. So you uh, Yeah, I'm on demo SSID. Oh, good catch. Sorry, one second, guys. I totally forgot. This is my work machine, which means it is totally firewall and locked down. Let me get this running on my personal machine real quick. Oh man, I can't work out of So I got the pip installed. So that's pretty This thing is going to connect to one of the You will need the actual So the friend is going to be a Sure, yeah, and then this guy is the same thing. Yeah, try Oh, is the is the server different? Yeah, this thing's Oh, okay. Yeah, should we, right. should, does everyone else know this now? No. Hey guys, so remember how I said it was 11.3? Uh, I was wrong. Try 11.27 instead. I switched machines because firewall, not firewall. Same port? Uh, yes, same to everything else. 11.27 or that? Yes. ATRC, so resetting, changing the mode to one. Hey, I got somebody. <laughs> they be in my machine. They got in. <laughs> Everyone DDoS them. Go, go, go. Hey, who's getting stuff? You're getting stuff. You get it. Who else is getting something? You get a package. Okay, okay. I got a package. Hey, check it out. You can, I got some. You can see it right here. Here's the server and it's sending things out. Give me some. You get a connection. You get a connection. Everybody gets a connection. Give me some. It's like GoPro right now. Yeah. Who wants a package? Who wants a package? Who's your package? 
<laughs> What's I supposed to say? What? Except to her. No, it should be all going back because you're sending it over us. We're supposed to send something? Yeah, so that means that. We're going to get to that. What are you doing? What are you doing? This is the code that it's running, and so if you're interested, right here is where all message received from the server, it take, prints message received, <laughs> then it goes to block. Is that code? I figured I, 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 on your slide, I followed both links, and one of them tried to bring that in. Yes, that's right here. Yes, look at the top. Oh, I decided to put it right there so it couldn't be missed. And so all it does is it uh, takes the message, and this message uh, score score negative one. It's using slicing in Python to just reverse the whole thing. And so it does a for each character in invert the index of it. can't open a socket in JavaScript in the browser. But you can socket out of it. No, you can be sockets. No, but you can be web sockets in JavaScript. Which, by the way, there is a, if you look on that page, there should also be a validator page that uses uh, a web socket thing. It's a web page that shows you how to validate it. So, is anybody still having trouble? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm going to go this way. Thank you. 
I don't know what the heck it is. I don't know what the heck it is. He doesn't have fitness. He has a running for a lot of it. So you have to actually run it. Yes. Yeah, that's good. He wants to update the one that's true. So what happened was, um, 